Hello, hello, Vegas. Hello, reInvent. How are you doing today? Okay, good. I, I was worried about that one. You know, it's afternoon. You probably just ate your lunch, right? So I just wanted to make sure that everybody is awake in here. Um, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's session. My name is Matt Gibbets. I'm a senior solutions engineer, engineer with Dynatrace, and this is... I thought you were going to introduce me. Do you not know who I am? Come on, we work through this. <laughs> <laughs> Susan St. Clair, uh, Principal Solutions Architect at Dynatrace, focusing on our security solution capability. And guys, today we're going to take you on a journey through talking about how to accelerate your secure and reliable AWS deployments with Dynatrace. Now, hopefully this title is uh, very meaningful to you guys, and we're going to talk a lot about that, but we also are going to talk about the importance of observability in this entire process. And hopefully by the end of the presentation here today, you guys will understand that observability really sits at the core of what you're trying to do in your environments when it comes to acceleration and automation. Now, first, first question I have to ask in here before we go anywhere else. <laughs> do we have any winners in the room from, from Blackjack or, or any other games? No winners? Do we have any losers? Do you have losers? Who played? Nobody played? Brave soul. Brave soul. Well, if, if you don't have any winners, I just want to tell you guys that you should stop at our booth, 606. We are giving out an Oculus Rift, so uh, maybe you can be a winner at the Dynatrice booth. So if, if you're not lucky in a casino, maybe you can be lucky at the Dynatrice booth. But with that said, let's go ahead and get it going. So actually, another question for you before we get started. Who knows what AWS is? Raise of hands. OK, that's good. How about Dynatrix? Who knows what Dynatrix is? All right, this is, this, is a really good, this is a pretty good response. Well, you guys can clearly see on the slide that we can describe Dynatrix in many different ways. But I like to essentially wrap it up in one sentence, and that's how I actually explained it to my grandma once, and she understood. So I know it's a good one, because she understood. <laughs> so when we really think about Dynatrix and what Dynatrix is, it is an observability platform that helps you guys find vulnerabilities and find issues in your environments and remediate them before they impact your organization before they impact anybody else in your environment. Do you guys agree with this, the ones that know Dynatrace? What do you think? Yeah, you think, you think that's good? All right, and, and throughout, the, throughout today's presentation, I think you guys will see a, a very cool kind of view on how Dynatrace really bakes in into the process that I'll be talking about today. One other thing I do want to mention, we are a 13-year um, leader in the Magic Quadrant for Gartner. I really like to point that out. We're very proud of it. Um, I've been with Dynatrix for five years, and every single year we've been that leader. So if you guys are a customer today, you guys are definitely in the good hands. You guys can also see I have this shirt in here. No worries, you've got Dynatrix. We also have these shirts at the booth, so you can definitely stop by. The next thing that I want to talk about in here today is our partnership with AWS. So we definitely want to thank AWS for giving us this opportunity to be here today. And we definitely want to highlight you know, our success with AWS as a partner. Um, I like to say we are the go-to-market partner. What that means is that whenever there is a new service that is being released by AWS, Dynatrix covers it from the monitoring perspective. We also have, I believe, seven competencies from AWS, and I think we have a pretty good announcement for you, Susan. Dun, dun, dun. We actually just got our security competency with AWS. I think it was announced yesterday, so we are extremely, I am extremely excited about that. See, I've been told we that. We didn't even update the slide yet. It's so new. That's, that's how new it is, right? We couldn't do it. We've been told that that's one of the hardest ones to get, so we, we're very proud of, of ourselves this weekend here. <laughs> but with that said, Susan will actually take you on a journey a little bit more on the AWS side of things and how you guys can really do very cool things when it comes to uh, secure and reliable AWS deployments. And the handoff, let's see if it's successful. So just to kind of put things into the framework of, uh, again, what Dynatrace does, how it maps out to some of the AWS best practices, you know, if we kind of look at the AWS well-architected observability, and that is a mouthful even right after lunch, um, you know, we're really looking at these uh, pillars, right? Like, what, what does it mean to have a, a good application running on uh, AWS? So, you know, of course, it has to work. <laughs> Number one, it has to work, has to be functional. Uh, it has to have uh, security. That's my, my love, right? Um, it has to be reliable. It has to be uh, performance. Uh, it has to be sustainable. And of course, I mean, for any of the non-techies, it has to work from a, a cost optimization strategy. So from a, how does Dynatrace kind of fit into this? 
again, as Matt said, you know, we're kind of really the observability, uh, that's kind of where we started, whether we're talking about performance, whether we're talking about availability, whether we're talking about security. So kind of, you know, first of all, we have to understand what's going on in our AWS environment. We have to understand, you know, what are our transaction flows? What are the risks associated with it? Again, performance, reliability, and security, whatever kind of risks we're talking about. You know, we have to understand, you know, what the digital experience is for our end users and how that maps to SLOs. And then, of course, you know, kind of getting back to that cost optimization, because it all comes down to dollars, you know, we want to make sure that we, we minimize the, the required resources, and then, you know, that will help us, like, stay within budget. That will help us stay within our cost constraints. So this is kind of our, our big vision. This is what we're trying to get to. Now, if we kind of, like, again, I work with a lot of customers that, you know, they're at various stages in the, the you know, the well-architected journey to AWS. So, you know, if we kind of look at, you know, starting for something that's very monolith, very, you know, on-prem, like, again, when I started my career more than a couple years ago, you know, this was, the, this was the world that I lived in. You know, and as we kind of move towards this, you know, vision of, of cloud native, you know, what does that look like, right? So, again, you know, whether we start with a lift and shift, like we just move it right to the cloud, right into EC2, all the way to, like, again, the, the, the goal here with really kind of a customer engineering approach where we're actually driving automation and really being able to accelerate, you know, our software delivery. So kind of like pulling it back into kind of the context of what we're talking here today, you know, how can automation and automation specifically with Dynatrace, because we're here with Dynatrace, you know, really support this journey uh, from a modernization point of view. Susan, I'm actually interested. How many of you guys in here is in stage number four today? Okay, we have a couple of hands. That's good. How about three? Okay. How about two? That's, I think, where we usually see the majority, right? That, that's stage number two in here where, yeah. where it's cloud managed, you know, move to managed. So, you know, this is definitely a long journey, and, and you guys don't get discouraged if you're even on, on level number one in here today, right? Yeah. Um, there's definitely a lot of things that, that, that need to be done, but you guys will see that as we kind of go through this journey, um, Dynatrace will be right along your side and really helping you move and, and reach that level four at the end of it. And I would even say, I think it's interesting, we tend to like look at organizations as kind of this homogeneous, like, oh, you're at stage one, stage two, stage three, whatever, right? But stage zero, right? Again, we have customers, I think, who are working with stage zero here. <laughs> we all have to start somewhere. Um, but, you know, really the fact of the matter is, you know, even within organizations, even within groups themselves, right, you'll have kind of this, like, dichotomy of kind of where they're at from a, a modernization point of view. So, Absolutely. Uh, so, as we're talking about, as we're on this journey, as we're on this pathway, wherever we're at, you know, really automation becomes the key to realizing some of these these, these goals, right, of, of why we're moving to uh, a, a cloud. So just to kind of level set here, as we do, the kind of the state of the world, this is not Dynatrace saying, this is Gartner, as you can hopefully read the very fine print, even on the very large screen. Um, we're, we're not quite there yet, right? So, you know, again, Gartner uh, talking to some of the leaders that, that they talk to, you know, we still have some, some room to, to improve um, in terms of automation. And certainly kind of as we, you know, look into the future, into, you know, this year, you know, being very specific at, you know, when we talk about typical automation use cases like DevOps, DevSecOps, you know, we still have a, a sizable time spent on manual tasks, which kind of defeats the point in my point, my idea of, of going to, to DevOps or DevSecOps. So again, all is not doom and gloom. Uh, you know, if we, if we spend the money, again, this is kind of the average spend on automation that Gartner is seeing within their customers, 9 million, which is a ridiculous number in my head. I wish number. I had that in my bank account. Um, but, you know, that, that does actually drive, right? So there is hope out there. So even as we kind of look at where people are at and organizations are at along this journey and you look at, you know, kind of, you know, somewhere where you're at in your organization in terms of like, oh my God, everything is so manual and like we're sending emails and, you know, you know the, the very lowest case. It, it, is, it is a journey and we'll talk about that a little bit, you know, as we get into the, the maturity model. So again, usually when I'm talking to my customers and we talk about sort of like, oh, let's do this automation and let's do this and that and oh, look at the fancy thing. They're like, 
That's something that other size organizations do. That's not us, right? And you can kind of see the pretty bar chart, bar chart here um, in terms of kind of you know, where, where folks are at. Certainly, I think like we see Gartner sees like most of the, the automation investment really you know, starting in, in large, large enterprises like Dynatrace, which makes sense. They're probably grown up um, around a lot of hodgepodge, you know, manual processes. They're really looking to optimize costs and drive efficiencies. But even within those organizations, they're looking to invest, you know, an additional, you know, 38%, 40% over the next year or so to continue that journey. But again, looking at even smaller organizations, which you would think would be very agile, they're automating a whole bunch of things, they still have room for improvement. So there's a fairly consistent, again, between like 25 and 40% in terms of what organizations are looking to invest to improve automation. So hopefully with kind of this background, you know, what we say today will become even more relevant in terms of what you can bring back to, to your home base, wherever that might be. Do you, do you guys have to fight for automation budget these days? Or is this kind of given? We do at Dynatrace. <laughs> <laughs> the, the race end means you have to fight for it. <laughs> right? I, I think that we definitely are seeing a lot of movement. And I think that the leaderships in, in many organizations start to understand that automation can actually help us save money. Right? But I think we still definitely see in the industry that it's not given, right, in every organization where we just throw money at, at, at automation, right? There's still kind of that perception that it's maybe the newest and coolest thing, but, you know, not everybody's there yet. So, you know, this data definitely shows that we're getting there, which is exciting because that means that we can get towards the stage when you guys will truly be proactive in your environments and you'll truly be able to start automating things that today maybe take way too long. But you know, this is definitely a trend in a good direction, so we are definitely excited about it. And then hopefully you guys are getting excited about that as well. But I think too, like one of the challenges, like again, you know, I, I talk, to, talk to my customers or even kind of you know, in my own life, like uh, we have a home automation system. I love it. Not, no, I'm, not, I'm not loving it. I'm not, I'm not a fan of automation here um, for various reasons. But, you know, I tend to think of like, oh, automation uh, at home. I'm going to automate the scene. And when I come home, I want like the lights to be dimmed to a certain thing. And, well, you know, when I, my alarm goes off, I can actually, there's home automation with the shower goes on at a certain temperature and there's mood light. Yeah. Anyway. Smart it, home. Way to go. <laughs> I think it's... Mm, Let's talk about that later, what, who's, <laughs> what's smart here. But, but I think there's this perception of automation is it's like an all or nothing thing. And so if you don't get to that kind of nirvana end state where everything is automated and everything is well defined, what's the point, right? So just like anything else in life, there is kind of a maturity model like in terms of kind of, you know, what should be automated. So we'll, we'll get there in just a second. But in terms of like, when we think about what should be automated and where do we start, rather than trying to you know, boil the ocean right at the get-go and being like, holy cow, this is too much, you know, we really should kind of take a step back and think about, well, well what, is it? what should we automate? So you're telling me that automation is not a silver bullet solution? It's not going to solve everything? Oh, no, that's not. It solves everything. World peace, my dirty dishes, <laughs> my child not wanting to eat her vegetables, everything. <laughs> everything is solved by automation. <laughs> That was sarcasm if you guys didn't. You guys oh, didn't. I'm sorry. There wasn't an indicator. <laughs> oh, we'll work on that then. <laughs> so to answer your question in terms of silver bullet, no, it is not a silver bullet. Not everything can be automated. But in terms of kind of the characteristics of what we're looking for, so first of all, look for what's repeatable. That seems not very obvious, but we have to state the obvious just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So... We want to look for things that are repeatable. So in terms of software releases, we're looking for deployments, releases, um, certain uh, workflows, right? Like, oh, if this happens, then we want to do that. Again, whether it's part of a release or a deployment or whatnot. We're also looking for, do we know what's expected? So if this happens, and it happens on a regular basis, Okay, that would be something that would be a good candidate for being automated, right? If this is something that has never happened in like the history of like my organization or my software deployment, probably not the time to start automating right then. Just a thought. Now everything else, you know, we're looking at, well, maybe we don't automate every single step, but then we're looking at orchestration, right? So, so how do we kind of pull everything together? And to do that, 
We need observability. Dun, dun, dun. Ding, ding, ding. Observability. We need to know what, what, what it is we're looking at, right? Otherwise, what are we orchestrating? And then, of course, we're looking at, okay, being able to ask certain questions and get the answers. And that's, I think, again, we're all like probably overloaded with AI <laughs> discussions at this point, but that's really where AI can really provide a lot of value in, in helping us get to those answers. I felt like you were gonna say there, I heard that. No, up here on the I, I, I keep my peace for now. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. So again, getting back to the, you know, automation is not a silver bullet. It's also not something where we have to go all in, whole hog, like from the get go. You know, we have to start somewhere. So again, we're looking for repeatable things. We're also looking for things that are expected that happen on a regular basis. And then, you know, if we kind of look at like, where do we start? Well, if we do a hand raising thing, because I think this is Matt's thing, he likes the poll questions. Um, how many people have cron jobs in their day to day or schedule jobs if we're doing like Windows? I would assume there's probably 100%. People are just tired, their arms are tired. So I'm just gonna say that. Um, right, this is, I mean, even I do automation in my own home, and obviously I'm anti-automation as we discussed <laughs> in the smart home thing. So this is something, this is a very easy place to start. So automate sending of reports, automate uh, infrastructure jobs, right? I want to reboot my servers, I want to recycle my, my uh, app pools like on some sort of regular basis. But this is typically where organizations start. And again, great, Great low-code, no-code sort of solution. Now, when we start to look at automation a little bit more interesting, and so maybe something that we typically think about when we talk about automation, now we're talking about kind of more event-driven. So my .NET IIS application crashes or is unresponsive every is Wednesday at 4.30. Okay, we could say Java. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm agnostic from a technology point of view. So uh, it happens every Wednesday at 4 p.m. It's unresponsive. That's the event. So what do we do? We recycle those apples. Or we recycle the, job, the, the JVM, right? Just because I'm Thank trying to be equal opportunity here. I have a sentiment for .NET, so everybody always blames .NET for everything. That's fair, that's fair. <laughs> I, I don't want to be a hater. I don't want to be a hater up here. It's recorded. So, um, so again, you know, we, we have this, these rules, we have these events, we want to do a certain thing. Again, my world, threat protection, more security. In that case, I see some sort of incident and I want to do something about it, right? So maybe again, I put a blocking rule in place, again, part of the capability of Donatrace, maybe I send some sort of email or some sort of alert, maybe I create some sort of ticket, but I do something based on some sort of event and then there's rules or there's certain procedures, right, that I'm following. When we get to like, kind of like, again, you know, we, we have like the customer engineering, super innovative, you know, app modernization journey. Well, similarly, when we're talking about automation and its maturity, now we're starting to not just be reactive and, oh, this event happened, I need to do something, something. Now I'm starting to say like, well, what if, right? So we start to get into like, That's again. That's La right? That's where you want to get. Like, this is like, everyone's like, I'm so tired of being reactive. I want to be proactive. Well, it's a journey. We're all on this journey together. Um, so again, I do fuzz testing. I do chaos engineering. I do, I do these what if scenarios, right? And then based on that, I do something, right? I automate something. But again, I'm moving from a reactive mode into a more proactive mode. And of course, that's the highest level of complexity in terms of not only what exactly am I trying to what if, but then also in terms of you know, how, how I actually get to that and how I actually automate that from an actual tactical hands-on level. And just to kind of wrap it back around, so we think, okay, we talked about like the investments, millions of dollars go in and we get these big savings and yay, everybody's investing in automation, so we're on the right path, we're on the right journey. Maybe not so much. <laughs> Maybe we're still, it's still a journey. Maybe we're stuck at the, you know, the gas station getting gas, getting snacks. <laughs> I'm hungry. I actually missed lunch. Um, so it's snacks. Um, but again, a survey that Dynatrace uh, put out, I think it was uh, well, 2023 at some point, so earlier this year. Um, not so much. We still have room to improve, right? So again, looking from a security lens, you know, asking our, our CISO customers or our customers. CISOs, I guess, more accurately, 
you know, they don't really see like much, um, much goodness coming out of automation, right? So again, you guys can read the, the numbers. They're nice and big on these nice big screens. But you know, if you're looking at over three quarters of the people that we talked about saying that DevSecOps doesn't work effectively, well, what is DevSecOps? A big tenant underlying foundation of DevSecOps is automation, right? Or vulnerability management. They have like 16,000 different tools, all like, full, like putting in vulnerabilities. How do I manage that complexity, right? How do I manage that environment? Automation, it's not doing its job. And of course, there's actual consequences to, I don't want to say failures, because that sounds horrible, but for these opportunities for improvement. Um, again, there's a direct cost on our development teams in terms of productivity. We're not getting that innovation, which was, again, the customer engineering, if we're talking about an app monetization point of view. Um, plus, there's always risks about like, hey, did you even test this thing? Because I'm not really sure what you did, right? So again, real costs outside of just saying, oh, we're not doing a good job. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, you're doing Passover number two. <laughs> so actually, that slide we just looked at, 50% CISOs is only confident that their software is completely tested before it goes into production. That's a little bit scary, right? So I figure like that's another poll. Yeah, How come on, raise the hands. Which 50% are you? Anyone, anyone? 50%, 25? And I came, originally my career started in the functional test uh, space, and I will say absolutely, 100% tested is, um, it's a dream. It's a dream, it's a life goal. Yeah, you know, we also gotta figure out what does completely tested mean, right? I mean, I think there's always, <laughs> always so many different scenarios that you can throw at it. But between that and maybe the other number that we just looked at, 68%, right, essentially, CISO says that there's definitely vulnerabilities being introduced to their environments because of the complexity of how their environment looks like today, right? I, I think that we ever, everybody in here probably sit in that complex model, right? Even if you are truly in AWS fully and, and you're using all these different cloud native services, they're so cool and you start releasing more and more and you, you have to innovate faster, you have to deliver new features. And what happens over time your environment gets more and more complex, and these vulnerabilities are sneaking in there. And AWS then introduces an update service that you're like, what? <laughs> and then you're like, oh, I should have used that, and then you write the application. <laughs> but guys, that's exactly where observability comes into place. So what you guys are looking at right now in here is the Dynatrace platform. And, and you probably are wondering, we're talking about automation, we're talking about accelerating the AWS deployments. Like, how, why is observability even important in here? Well, it's important because in order to automate, you first have to know what your environment looks like and what it behaves like, behaves like. especially when these environments are getting more and more complex. Mm -hmm. And Dynatrace will be able to help you in here. As you go through the different pillars in here, through the first two pillars, infrastructure monitoring and application monitoring, we'll be able to actually understand how your environment is architected, how the transactions flow through your environment, to exactly paint for you the picture of no matter how complex your environment is, no matter how hybrid it is, no matter how multi-cloud it is, you understand what it looks like. There's only one cloud. Oh, it's like only AWS, I forget about that. <laughs> He's new, it's okay. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that, but no, you guys, you guys obviously know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> the next two pillars, security. Knowing how your environment looks like, knowing how it's architected, will not be able to point out for you where there are vulnerabilities. And then through the pillar at the end, once we know how your environment looks like, once we know how it performs, when we, once we know where the vulnerabilities are, we'll actually be able to start helping you make the business processes or, or the business decisions better to figure out where we can actually introduce automation. Because let's be honest in here. If you automate a wrong process, you're just automating and multiplying problems in your organization. And I've seen it so many times where somebody comes in and says, oh, we're spending so much time doing this manually, we have to automate this. And they kind of fall into this bubble when they start just thinking that automation is gonna solve all the problems. But they don't really truly know how their environment looks like, how it behaves under circum certain circumstances. And then so they start automating the wrong processes. Lastly, through the digital experience and business analytics, Dynatrace will then help you understand what is the impact 
of the changes and automation tasks that you are adding in your environment. So you can actually show your leadership and you can show your organization that you are saving money, that you are multiplying revenue. Because at the end of the day, that's what we care about, right? We all talk about software working mm -hmm. perfectly. And, and I think with automation, we have this opportunity to really elevate this game to the whole new level. We are able to focus on the tasks inside of our IT environments that will actually propel our business forward. Now, I made all these statements how Dynatrix is going to help in here. You guys are probably wondering, OK, from the technology perspective, like, well, like is this just the magic, right? This is that silver bullet that we're talking about? It's pixie dust. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> but you know, no, there's actually specific capabilities from the technology perspective that we bring into the table that will allow us to help you accomplish that. And the first one that I want to talk about is, we call it smart skip topology. I'm sorry, our marketing team, total buzzword. I don't actually really know what it means, so I gave it my own name. Real-time architecture diagram with Dynatrix. As your environment scales up, as you work in these dynamic environments in AWS, EKS, ECS, Lambdas, as you're using new cloud native services, as your environment scales up, scales down, Dynatrix will automatically understand how your environment looks like at all times and will understand the different dependencies between the different monitored entities. So now you know that if you're just trying to automate a process that possibly is touching the most important components in your environment, you really have to make sure that you're on point. Because if you automate it incorrectly, you're just going to introduce a whole lot of issues into your environment. Well, I think that comes back to like, what are we automating, right? Really having that, that understanding of, of is it repeatable, is it expected, to your point, right? Like exactly. uh, having that observability. Exactly. The second thing that we bring to the table is end-to-end -end traceability and code level visibility. Why is this important in this conversation? <laughs> well, let's remember that what we want to do is we. When we talk about really automating things in your environment, reliability and security are the two most important things. Knowing exactly how your code is performing and knowing exactly what code you're using, that's the only way for us to be able to deliver that. That's a statistic we didn't have on a slide, but do you guys know that over 65% of vulnerabilities in your environment comes in from the application code? That is a huge number. So knowing how your applications are actually designed, how they're performing, and knowing that every single API call, where it ended up, how it executed, what method, what function are we invoking, it's very, very important to this entire equation. The next thing that Dynatrix brings into the table is that once we know how your environment looks like, once we know how it's performing, once you're able to identify all these vulnerabilities, that's a whole lot of telemetry. That's a whole lot of data. Who's scared of data in here? Right? I sometimes get scared of data because there's so much of it. There's so Only much when data. It's my data, and I'm like, where is that going? <laughs> right? <laughs> you can pull in so many different metrics and so many different events and so many different logs, and you get all this telemetry. And if we have to do all the analysis ourselves, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys are brilliant, or all of you are brilliant, but there's just too much data for us to be able to do all that analysis. That's exactly why, at the core of our platform, we have an AI apps engine. And I do have to say it in here. I know everybody has AI attached to their solution today. Dynatrace had AI apps engine at the core of our platform before it was cool, in 2014. <laughs> before people were really talking about AI and, and, and it kind of started bolding things onto the products, Dynatrace has started our Dynatrace platform solution with the AI apps engine at the core. And what this AAPS engine is allowing us to do now, it is really allowing us to understand different performance patterns, and in general, just different behavior of your environments. And that is very, very critical in here in terms of automation, because if we don't know the patterns, if we don't know how these environments are behaving under stress, if we don't know how they're behaving over time, it's hard to make the right decision. So using that predictive analysis of the AAPS engine, mm -hmm. using that decision-making driven by this analysis, really will help you make more educated and better educated decisions of where you have to apply this automation to actually, to actually yield the best results. And so that's... Oh. And I guess, no, like on the, the maturity model, right? Like that's really being able to, to drive with AI and like exactly. kind of understand, right? Like move from reactive to proactive. Absolutely, right? Right on the right-hand side, you guys had this pillar with AI. That's where you want to get, right? The yellow pillar. <laughs> the yellow pillar, yep. <laughs> Now, let, let's, let's talk through it with an example. 
right? So we talked about this traceability, we talked about the real-time architecture diagram, we talked about the AAPS engine helping us make you know, educated decisions to propel our business forward. How does this look like in a real example in here? Well, here's one. So let's talk about automated runtime vulnerability analytics, right? So we talk about security, talk about performance. In this case, let's really talk about security. The first question that we always ask ourselves on, when it comes to vulnerabilities is, am I exposed? Well, what does this question really mean? I absolutely love this slide. In the middle, this question, am I exposed, can mean so many different things. Is the code with the vulnerability being used? Is the vulnerability exploited to the public internet? Are multiple entities affected? It is such a loaded question. And if you don't have a true understanding of your environment, if you don't know how your environment is architected, if you don't know where all these transactions are flowing through, it's impossible for you to answer these questions. And if you can't answer these questions, you can forget about automation. I think like from a, it depends on who you ask. If this is mine, it's more do I have to do something about this? I mean, I got yep. stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's, 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 a great, that's a great point too, right? <laughs> Outside of am I exposed, right? The question is, okay, if I am exposed, right? Yeah. Do Are I you actually... going to make me do something? Yeah, right. Are you going to make me work? Exactly. <laughs> And here's now where the AAPS comes into the equation. Because if we have to do something, there are things that we can do automatically. When we know, when we can catch a vulnerability during your, during your CICD pipeline or SDLC pipeline, when we can automatically fail your deployment and prevent this vulnerability getting into the production environment in the first place, that's going to save you guys so much time. Because you won't have to get this spreadsheet from the security team with a thousand vulnerabilities one week later where your application teams will now have to stop in the middle of the sprint and start remediating vulnerabilities, right? It won't stop. What's that? As a, a former product person, we wouldn't stop. You <laughs> wouldn't stop, but it would Exceptions definitely- Exceptions are filed. Just add, piled up, right? <laughs> exactly. Now, Susan and I figured that, you know, kind of talking about uh, the automation here and talking about Dynatrace, it's a cool topic, but I feel like everybody always does presentations. So what are we actually gonna do in here? We're actually going to switch it to just a little demo to show you the features that I just talked about in a form of a demo. A so, live demo, not recorded. So Feel the risk. Scary stuff. <laughs> Let's see if that's gonna work. Done. All right, perfect. Who knows what this is? Come on, you guys said you know Dynatrix. Uh, mind map. Mind map, yeah. <laughs> that's the smart skip topology that I talked about, right? But <laughs> what it really is, in my opinion, it is the real-time architecture diagram. So what you guys are looking at right now, it is essentially a demo environment in Dynatrace, but what we are showing you is how your environment is actually architected in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just navigate to a data center in here, and I'm gonna go ahead and pick one of our AWS availability zones in here to show you guys what that really tells you. So look at that. Talking about complexity. <laughs> I mean, just in this scenario, I have eight Linux EC2 instances and two Windows EC2 instances, and look at the amount of technologies that I have wrapped in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talking about complexity. <laughs> I mean, come on. And then, and then imagine you running this actually on EKS. And the, the, these technologies can go from, you know, hundreds of them being used at the peak where you have a lot of users mm -hmm. to really dropping down to, to a lower number. With Dynatrace, all you have to do is you'll deploy our one agent on the underlying infrastructure component, we will automatically create this real-time architecture diagram for you. So as, as things are changing, we'll automatically let you know what they look like. So you don't have to worry about wondering whether you know, the change that you just made broke something. You will automatically know what your environment looks like at, the whole, at all times. The second thing that we talked about just a little bit ago is that visibility into the code level. That's when we are able to get very, very granular. So when we talk about DevSecOps and really working with the development teams and the application development teams, that's what's gonna be a gold mine for them. Because they will be able to come into Dynatrace and say, you know what, this transaction took 700 milliseconds and you know, oh by the way, here are the log events that are being generated during this transaction. So you really are talking about a single pane approach in here to observability to help you understand how your environment looks like and performs like at all times. Why is this important again though? Because when these problems and vulnerabilities arise in your environment, you will need this data to understand what's happening. But Dynatrace has even a better answer in here. We will help you 
by automatically providing you insights into the problems that you have in your environments and the vulnerabilities that you have in your environments. So you won't have to go out there and spend all this time building dashboards because we have better things to do. We want to build automation. We don't want to spend all this time building dashboards. So with Dynatrace, when we discover a problem in your environment, we'll automatically point out for you what is that impact of that problem. Giving you that business driver in here, telling you how many users is being impacted. And now we can very easily take this problem, and we, Susan and I will talk about it in just a second, but we'll be able to automatically now drive remediation knowing that there is a problem in your environment. How can we do that? Using the mapping that, and understanding how your entire environment looks like and how these transactions are flowing through the environment, we are now able to point out what is the root cause of the problem. And knowing what is the root cause of this problem, like in this case, you can see it was a deployment, so we basically deployed a code that broke the application. Now, we are in the perfect position to start talking about automation and remediation because we know exactly what caused this problem in the first place. It is a deployment, so now we can talk about rolling it back. And you guys will see that example in just a second. And last but not least, to show you that security, um, security capability in here, why is it again important? Because Dynatures will keep all the things in context of your environment. There's always hundreds or thousands of vulnerabilities in their environment. But Dynatrace, knowing the context, knowing the architecture of your environment, knowing how these transactions are flowing through your environment, will be very easily able to point out for you, you know what? There's only a certain number of vulnerabilities that have public internet exposure. And there's only a certain number of vulnerabilities that have vulnerable function in use. So keeping that in mind, Dynatrace is now putting you in a perfect position to start talking about automation and remediation because we are getting you to that root cause. We are getting you to that point in your environment that is causing the issue, that is causing the vulnerability. With that said, the demo worked, so I'm gonna have one more slide and I'm gonna pass it back to Susan. I just like to talk a lot, so. Really to wrap up everything that we talked about in here. Why do we need observability when we talk about automation, accelerating, secure, and reliable AWS deployments? I think the best way to, to say it is this. Because you can't secure, fix, and definitely not automate things that you can't see. And with Dynatrace, you will be able to see them. So with that said, Susan, let's talk about some automation. Let's do it. I feel like that was a mic drop, like boom. <laughs> All right, so great. We have the observability. We know how things are connected. We can now let's do something about it, right? So when people talk about automation, it's usually, I see this, great. Let's like automate some, some manual processes, right? So again, kind of like going back to, you know, getting data to the right teams in an automated, efficient, collaborative sort of manner. Again, as we're building automation maturity, you know, let's say, again, something near and dear to my heart, I have, I don't know, maybe some sort of AWS guard duty service, and I am getting alerts all the time. So again, Dynatrace is actually a user. This is actually coming out of our own um, product, uh, R&D, security practices, you know, all of them collaborating together. So again, you know, what I wanna do is I wanna cut through the noise, right? So security products typically, for those of you who don't know, they're a little chatty. They're a little bit noisy, potentially. So there. in this sort of, I mean, I've heard, I've heard rumors, <laughs> maybe, at that, in the, the hallway outside. Um, so, you know, we want, we want to, we don't want to, uh, there has a place, right? We, we still want to get that data, right? We, we still want to get that observability, but we don't want to like overload the people who have to do something about it to make sure that it's something real, you know, with, with all of this noise, right? So again, we're kind of taking that data, we're enriching that data with the observability um, and the ownership that Dynatrace has, kind of that visibility that Matt was showing in terms of the, what did you call that? Automated dependency mapping, something, something, something. Real-time architecture diagram. Come we on. need an acronym for that. We do. <laughs> <It's> too many <laughs> words. So basically kind of, you know, enriching it with that information, getting the, the context specific, um, and then again, really being able to drive collaboration. So getting that data, getting that observability, merging it with what Dynatrace sees, um, including the ownership information. And then of course, like notifying the right people that, hey, you know, of these 400,000 alerts, here are like the four tickets that really matter, right? Because again, we want to drive outcomes with automation, not just automate to automate, right? Who cares about that? 
The second kind of, uh, again, use case as we're kind of building through this maturity model from an automation point of view is closed loop remediation. So at the end of the day, we want to really reduce mean time to remediation because honestly, let's be real. This is just kind of a, a, a byproduct of, of what we have, right? Our technology stack, our legacy applications, what have you. We really want to get to the innovation part, the fun part. So how do we optimize kind of this, this tech debt, if you will, or, or kind of this like byproduct of, of applications? So again, very similarly, again, if we kind of think back to the maturity model, I have this event, something happened, security, performance, reliability, whatever, right? Something happened, some event. So we're able to detect that. We're able to uh, then enrich that again with the observability context. Um, and then really drive context specific remediation. So again, if I'm talking about a security issue, maybe that's a remediation workflow. Or uh, if I'm talking about a, a problem, maybe that's a ticketing. But again, right, really understanding what the problem is. And then that is the, actually the closed loop remediation that we would automate. And then, of course, at the end of the day, driving collaboration, nothing happens if there's not a ticket, it doesn't exist. Um, or if there's not a Slack mass a message, it didn't exist either. So again, we, we want to have that particular part of the, of the workflow as well. And now back to you. Go back to, to another use case. Da -da. So site reliability guardian, that's, that's where we start in here. But I'm going to actually click two times in here because I, I do have to ask you a question. Susan already said I love asking questions. So, <laughs> who in here? It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> who in here is an SRE? Who oh, knows an SRE? No SREs? Oh, come on. You guys are lying <laughs> to me. There you go. Okay, who in here works you know, in, in a de DevSecOps portion of your organization? That should be probably all hands, <laughs> right? Um, but we as Dynatrace understood that when it comes to automation, I think there's the, the two main use cases that we talk about. The one that Susan just talked about, which is that self-remediation. But I think a big benefit of automation we can, we can also drive if we really talk about automating your deployments, right? So really dive into that CICD pipeline, that SDLC pipeline, <coughs> excuse me, and help you automate things in there. The, the, the biggest, I think, challenge in there is that once you start automating things inside of your CICD pipeline, you need to make sure that this automation is helping you essentially accelerate the right things and is not just multiplying the, the issues in your environment. Well, and I think this also allows us to get to the proactive piece. Absolutely. Right? Because that's how you will be able to actually start doing things earlier in the development of your product, right? Mm -hmm. Not after the fact. And Having, keeping that in mind, with Dynatrace has developed is a brand new application that we call Site Reliability Guardian. What that application really does for you, it dives into a concept of quality gates. I'm sure you guys have heard about it, right? But really what the quality gates are in here is a way for us to help you guys improve the reliability, quality, performance, and security of your software. How do we do that? The way we will do it is by establishing KPIs and essentially requirements that your software has to pass before it ever makes it to the next environment that you guys are pushing it to, whether it is from dev to QA or from, uh, from QA to production. Right? So now, having that in mind, if we can define these KPIs, we can now use the site reliability guardian application inside of Dynatrace to actually understand whether that software is fulfilling all these KPIs, whether they're business KPIs or whether they're performance KPIs. And as we do that, we'll now be able to automatically make a decision whether it is OK for you to push that new feature to the next level, whether it is OK for you to push it to the next environment, whether it is OK for you to push it into production without impacting any users. What that will look like from a technology perspective is really this. It's very simple. You well, <laughs> it's very simple to configure. <laughs> the hardest part in here is to actually figure out what are these KPIs for your business. Mm -hmm. What do we care about? Errors, response time, usability. Uh, exposure. Exposure. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> this, is, this isn't from security. <laughs> See, but that's the thing. The moment we are able to figure these things out, we are now able to put them inside of the site reliability guardian. And as soon as we do that, we are now again in a perfect spot to start automating the different tasks inside of your CI CD pipeline. So how will we do it inside of Dynatrace? 
We're going to go back to the automation workflows that Susan just talked about. So what I have in here? I have an automation workflow inside of Dynatrace. And what the trigger for this automation workflow tells you, there's basically a piece of metadata, which again is the beauty of having the observability platform in place. We know about it. We know that there was a deployment change. And as soon as there was a deployment change, what Dynatrace does, it kicks off the site reliability guardian. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there is more, right? <laughs> so now, as it kicks off the site reliability guardian, it essentially evaluates automatically without you having to analyze any data. It automatically evaluates the data in your environment against the KPIs that you have set up. So you don't have to wonder anymore, okay, is my error rate going off the roof after this release? Is my response time climbing? Dynatrees will automatically evaluate it inside of the site reliability guardian. And that gives us a perfect information now or a perfect ability to know what we have to do next. Because now we can make an educated decision automatically what needs to happen in your environment. If one of these KPI was breached, if the feature we just developed introduced a high error rate, or it slowed down the microservice that we just released it into by five seconds, we probably want to roll it back, right? We, we, we don't want to push it to the next environment. And having that information at your fingertips, and having that as a part of your automation workflow inside of Dynatrace, we'll be able to automatically take the right action. We'll be able to automatically say, go ahead and promote it. It passed all of our KPIs. Or we're gonna be able to say, roll it back. It actually is breaking our application. Mm -hmm. The users are being impacted. Or even from a security point of view, like again, like I, I have public exposure, I have a vulnerability. Well, maybe I kick off an exception workflow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because I got, I got things I got to do. I got to release this thing, right? So again, as long as the process is known, it's repeatable, we can then automate that. Absolutely, right? And keep in mind that everything that we are showing you in here is an automated action taken by Dynatrace after you have defined those KPIs inside of your site reliability guardian, whether they're performance-driven KPIs, business-driven KPIs, or security-driven KPIs. With that said, I do want to talk about one more scenario in here. And this specific scenario really talks about one of my favorite things, but also kind of a little bit of a scary thing. Who has heard or who's maybe doing it today? Testing in production. I think I saw a t-shirt actually on the floor. <laughs> we tested that, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Testing in production. As scary as this sounds, I actually think it's brilliant. Because how many times you guys have in essentially an environment that's that, that in a lower environment that can mimic exactly what the production environment looks like in terms of the load, in terms of the architecture. It's very, very hard. So really introducing the, the ability in here of what, what I really talk about in here is that A-B testing, mm -hmm. where you can automatically use the Dy Dynatrix automation workflows to automatically test in production the changes that you have pushed. And if you embrace that concept of A-B testing, what you'll be able to do is, let's say you push that new microservice to only 5% of your users. Okay, 5% is not a big number, but it's probably better than some made up data in the lower environment. Mm -hmm. Now, as soon as you do that, you use the automation workflow I just showed you before to automatically evalu evaluate these 5% of transactions, these 5% of users against the KPIs. Guess what? If everything is cool, we automatically can now trigger another release that will now push that new microservice to 25%. And then that's a repeatable cycle, which is what Susan was talking mm -hmm. about. Automation now is driving the development and the deployment of our microservices, and it helps us innovate at a pace that we haven't been able to do it before. Because the entire manual duration that you have to put into this process today can be automated if you really nail it up front by defining the right KPIs and by using a platform that can help you with observability and automation at the same time. Mm -hmm. Pass it one more time to Susan. I think this is the last pass though. So everyone, <laughs> you saw that? All right. So, so far, again, kind of switching gears a little bit. So we've really talked about automation in terms of, first of all, discovery, understanding what I have. So the whole observability aspect of it in an automated sort of way. We've also talked about, you know, how do we use automation to deliver, again, kind of through the, the closed uh, loop remediation, through the, the releasing, the progressive delivery uh, release cycles, 
But now we're kind of switching gears a little bit to actually give us insight in terms of like, how am I doing from a process point of view, right? So in an automatic way, again, security, as we know, like we're 50 minutes in now, I think you guys know where I'm coming from. <laughs> but you know, how, how do I know that I'm doing a good job, right? So what we're looking at here is, again, in an automated way, do I have something running in a runtime environment, typically production, right, where it's the riskiest, that I never even looked at from a security point of view, right? So basically being able to take that data from your left tool of choice, bring your own, mapping it against, enriching that data with what Dynatrace sees from an observability point of, point of view to say, hey, this is running. You guys never even looked at it from a security point of view on the left side of the house. I then need to now go and talk to whoever owns that, what happened, you know, where are the gaps, where does the process need to be improved. So in a continuous sort of a process improvement sort of way, again, and another, I guess, use case of automation to help us streamline and deliver performance and secure applications. So kind of wrapping up here, again, you know, when we're looking, we're talking about uh, boundless automation, you know, to me, I'm always like, when people are like, well, what about this? And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm always like, but I don't understand, like break it down for me. So when we're talking about boundless automation, again, you know, we're talking about, you know, it's kind of these, these targeted notifications, like really focusing on the teams that, that, uh, that need to know uh, and allowing that, that collaboration between those teams. We're talking about closed root root closed loop remediation, oh, that's a mouthful. Uh, we're, we're talking about like moving from kind of a reactive mode into more of a proactive mode with change uh, and release impact analysis and that progressive delivery orchestration, kind of what Matt was talking about in terms of like A-B testing, red-green testing. And then of course, you know, making sure in an automated efficient way that you know, we're not releasing things into our environments that, that don't meet our business uh, objectives or some of our performance or security objectives. And then of course, we always wanna make sure that we're constantly monitoring, we're constantly improving, whether we're talking about processes, whether we're talking about vulnerabilities, whether we're talking about performance, again, kind of coming back into that well-orchestrated you know, AWS architecture, right? And some of those key pillars of things that we need to look at you know, as we're moving from, again, you know, some sort of a transition from you know, a legacy or a, a fully cloud-native customer engineering type application. So the goals, we wanna prevent proactively, which I feel like that's a double, like they're the same thing. <laughs> they're both preventative. So we wanna prevent in a proactive way. We wanna operate efficiently, uh, obviously remediate faster so we can innovate. Uh, we wanna protect. And then of course, at the end of the day, we wanna accelerate our business. So from a streamlining, you know, uh, how do we streamline application delivery with, with Dynatrace specifically? You know, this is how we can do this with the capability uh, as well as working with AWS. So some of the key takeaways, hopefully, you know, again, uh, that you got from, from this session. Um, again, we wanna provide a unified platform for the key stakeholders involved in the application delivery you know, process. Again, whether it's security, whether it's operations, infrastructure, what have you. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're looking at an application holistically, you know, from both performance and security point of views, and obviously, you know, get ahead of any problems that might come out of that as we release. Automate, automate, automate what matters, and I would say asterisk, footnote, where it makes sense. Not everything needs to be automated. And then, of course, so don't, don't go all in, start small and scale up. Get the quick wins, get the easy wins, and then build the business case out, especially as we're kind of looking at, you know, the investment, right, that organizations wanted to put. You know, we need those successes. We need to show the value. So that, that's the, the easiest way to start. I'm gonna add one more. Oh, there's yeah, no more bullets. Show my T-shirt in here. <laughs> Most importantly, don't Bring worry us. if you've got Dynatrace. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think, uh, yep, that was the last one. Thank you. I think we have about five-ish minutes, according to the timer, according for any questions, comments.